Hi, and welcome to the Emerging Voices Network's anthology launch event on strengthening the humanitarian impacts agenda within the NPT, early career and youth perspectives and recommendations. My name is Anna Kita, and I'm one of the policy fellows at BASIC, and I'm also one of the coordinators of the EVN. To give some context, BASIC's Emerging Voices Network seeks to reach, engage, and platform early career and young experts from backgrounds that are underrepresented in mainstream nuclear policy fora. The EVN is committed to helping overcome institutional barriers to ensure that our spaces are truly global and that the perspectives and expertise of communities that are often minoritized yet impacted by nuclear weapons development and policy are centered and integrated into mainstream nuclear dialogue. In October 2023, the EVN launched a policy cycle focused on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. With generous support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway, this EVN policy cycle explores the HINW agenda in the context of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, also known as the NPT. The issue of nuclear harms is gaining traction in the international community. With the entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, and growing momentous advocacy efforts by international civil society on the medical and environmental impacts of nuclear weapons, testing, use, and accidents. Concurrently, nuclear tensions are at their highest since the Cold War, and the nuclear policy community faces challenges around the siloed nature of those working on issues of nuclear risk. So it's logical that we reflect as a community on the implications of the human humanitarian impacts agenda beyond the TPNW context, given that ultimately so much of the TPNW community and its signatories also make up the community of the NPT and its member states. When considered within the wider context of the breakdown of key nuclear arms control agreements, the war in Ukraine, the role of emerging technologies in nuclear issues and funding constraints for key stakeholders, bolstering the NPT must remain a key priority for us. We feel that work on humanitarian impacts is fundamental to this and that there are a range of opportunities for us to better center it within the NPT space. At BASIC and the EVN, we felt that it was really important to empower the next generation living with the ongoing threat of nuclear war to share their own insights and solutions to these nuclear harms and risks. On this basis, this policy cycle examines the intersection of humanitarian impacts in the NPT and asks how can both be strengthened in relation to one another. The findings of these policy papers and their recommendations center foremost on strengthening efforts around the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons agenda within the NPT context. They also explore the importance of de-siloing the nuclear field, identifying areas of complementarity between the NPT and TPNW, and also reiterate the value of commitments to multilateralism and disarmament. Reflecting on and addressing these issues plays a crucial role in informing both contemporary and future nuclear policy decisions in the best interests of peace and security, one which centers those most affected by nuclear risks and harms. With this in mind, Five EVN working groups, each led by two co-chairs, researched and drafted policy papers, including a set of policy recommendations for the international community to consider and take forward. Their areas of focus span across the NPT community's key stakeholders and the treaty's three pillars, non-proliferation, peaceful uses, and disarmament, in order to build a holistic approach to reducing nuclear harms within this space. So the five working groups focused on some key areas. This was one, engaging the P5, two, the role of civil society, three, nuclear education and knowledge, four, nuclear safety and security, and five, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The re resulting anthology, which was an absolute pleasure to have edited, provides valuable insights and innovative solutions from emerging researchers and young professionals in the nuclear policy field. And it emphasizes the importance of engaging with the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons within the mainstream international nuclear policy space. The community, we hope, with reading this anthology and attending this webinar today, should also recognize the salience of these issues for the incoming generation of nuclear experts and consider their recommendations that they've made in this paper as part of a broader, public, um, broader effort to make this field more accessible, representative, and inclusive of emerging and minoritized voices. Today, we're joined by some of our absolutely brilliant working group chairs who will present on their work and their findings. At the end of the session, we have space for Q&A, and I really encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function, um, both throughout the event and at the end. I do ask that you feel free to specify if your question is aimed at a specific working group or if it's open to all, because once I start fielding them, that'll be really helpful. The publication um, of the anthology is now available online on the BASIC website, and I will shortly drop a link into the chat. Um, and with that, I will hand over to our first working group, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. This working group was chaired by Ali Alkis, NTI's Emerging Nuclear Security Leader, WINS Ambassador to Turkey, and PhD candidate at Hesitat University, 
and Hri Pati Patrisa Mudra, Associate at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Today we're joined by Hri and um, I will shortly hand over to her. So thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone from Jakarta. Thank you so much for uh, attending, colleagues and uh, partners here. Um, so we are representing the DEI um, group. Uh, I would like to also uh, present um, the result of our uh, policy paper. So today uh, we really embark on a strategic, um, you know, mission to also refine the nuclear non-proliferation treaty through a framework that integrates diversity uh, and then the equity and inclusion at its very foundation. And the objective goes beyond mere reform. So we really aim to revolutionize how the NPD functions in an interconnected and diverse world. And this journey is not only just about a compliance with the contemporary global standards, but also leveraging inclusivity as a strategic asset to enhance the treaty's effectiveness and global acceptance. Moving on to the next slide. So this initiative is driven by a panel of eminent experts. Um, uh, with the extensive experience in nuclear policy and, and human rights and international diplomacy. Uh, Ali and, and there also Elisa who is here and your Dowlet uh, and then also Crystal Barakat and so on and so forth. And next slide, please. Thank you very much. So our team's diverse backgrounds ensure that a multidimensional approach to each policy recommendation. Uh, moving on to the next slide, it's um, about the current state of diversity in NPD processes. So a critical evaluation of the NPD reveals a significant gap in representation across, um, you know, like several dimensions in gender, in geography, and also in socioeconomic status. And this gap not only undermines the treaty's legitimacy, but also limits its effectiveness. So the perspectives of women, of youth, and professionals from the global south are also currently underrepresented and then also resulting in policies that may not fully address or understand the scope of like global nuclear challenges. So our discussion today challenges us to think critically about these gaps and their implications for nuclear governance. Moving on to the next slide, um, which is the structural barriers to inclusivity. So um, several structural barriers simply through, um, you know, inclusivity within the NPD processes and this include like limited time allocations that disproportionately affect smaller delegations and then like financial constraints that also prevent full participation by economically disadvantaged states and then physical and linguistic uh, barriers that exclude key stakeholders. So addressing these barriers, we really think that it's really essential not only for the fairness, but also for the efficacy of the treaty itself as diverse input is crucial for robust, resilient decision making. Making. So moving on to the next slide, um, the, about the importance of diverse perspectives, there is a question that arose from um, this slide, which is why prioritize diversity? So this answer lies in the proven benefits of like diverse decision making bodies, because research and historical data shows that diverse groups uh, are better at problem solving and also the innovate, the innovating one, because particularly in complex high stakes uh, environments like nuclear governance, and by embracing a wide range of cultures gender and professional backgrounds. So the NPD can also enhance its problem solving capacity and also like develop policies that are more comprehensive and universally applicable. Next slide to addressing historical inequalities. So historical inequalities within nuclear governance, we found that it have left deep scars, particularly in communities that directly affected by nuclear testing and also the deployment. So these communities often lack the voice and platform to also influence policies that continue to affect their lives. And by integrating these perspectives into the NPD, we not only act justly, but also enrich the treaty's understanding and response to the humanitarian impacts of the nuclear activities. Moving on to the next slide seven, which is strategic funding for uh, inclusive participation. So to transform um, intention into action, we then propose the establishment of a strategic fund designed to 
facilitate participation from underrepresented regions. So this fund will support travel, will support um, accommodation and conference space for delegates uh, from these regions and ensuring that financial constraints do not hinder their valuable contributions. And this initiative is about democratizing um, the process of nuclear diplomacy, uh, making it as inclusive in practice as in its in uh, the theory itself. Moving on to the bridging gender disparities. Next slide, please. So gender disparities um, and nuclear policy are not just about numbers, but also it's about like the qualitative difference that also diverse gender perspectives bring to the table. So to bridge these gaps, we are proposing targeted initiatives that focus on in creating, you know, like the participation and leadership of women in the NPD processes. So this includes setting specific gender quotas and then developing mentorship programs to also prepare the next generation of female leaders in nuclear governments. And then uh, moving on to the uh, next slide, which is empowering youth participation. We really think that the youth in engagement in the NPD is currently limited to like the peripheral roles and oftentimes it also symbolic or like educational in nature and then we envision a paradigm shift where the youth are core contributors involved in substantive policy making and advocacy so to achieve this we propose uh, the creation of structured programs that also provide real influence and platforms for the youth to also shape the policies that will define the future. Uh, moving on to the next slide, with, which is to enhancing um, scientific engagement. So we do realize that the scientific community's role in the NPD is really, really critical, but it oftentimes underutilized in strategic decision making, right? So to rectify this, we propose establishing a permanent scientific advisory board comprising experts from diverse disciplines. And this board will also ensure that the latest scientific research on technological advancement uh, inform the treaties policies and making them both cutting edge and grounded in empirical evidence. Moving on to the next slide, which is to implementing ban mandatory diversity quotas. Uh, we do realize that in ensuring our commitment to diversity is realized in practice, we then propose uh, the implementation of mandatory diversity quotas. So these quotas will apply to all the NPD delegations and committees, ensuring that we not only preach inclusivity, but also practice it. So this step will also institutionalize diversity within the NPD and making it a fundamental aspect of its governance uh, structure. And then next slide. Um, it's all about the effective reform that requires uh, revisiting the foundational procedures. So um, we really aim to extend the duration of like the discussions to allow for more in-depth deliberation and then to also enhance the transparency of decision-making processes. And these reforms are designed to ensure that every participant, regardless of their country size um, and the uh, you know, like power has also like an equal opportunity to also like contribute to the discourse and influence outcomes. And jumping onto the next slide, um, it's about the expert exchange program. Uh, we also propose the expert exchange program that aims to also foster an ongoing exchange of knowledge and like best practices among nuclear governments, uh, governance experts uh, worldwide. So this program will support capacity building in underrepresented regions and promote a more balanced distribution of expertise and ensuring that all regions have both a voice and the knowledge necessary to participate if effectively um, in the NPD. Jumping onto the next slide, uh, which is to monitoring and evaluation system. So we really realized that a robust monitoring and evaluation system is pretty crucial, pretty essential to also like track our progress toward these uh, ambiguous goals. So this system will not only measure the impact of our DEI initiatives, but also provide transparency and then also the accountability. And by regularly assessing our progress, we can um, make informed adjustments to our strategies and then also like ensuring they remain effective and responsive to the evolving needs of uh, the global uh, community. And moving on, on to the next slide, which is to addressing uh, accessibility concerns. 
Um, well, we really think that accessibility is a cornerstone of inclusivity so that we are committed to ensuring that all the NPD facilities and communications are really accessible to everyone, irrespective of physical abilities or language proficiency. So this includes um, providing like physical accommodations, uh, those are the things that we proposed for and like translation services and also the other assistive technologies that facilitate full participation. So um, last slide would be the conclusion. So in conclusion, um, the reforms that we propose today are not merely administrative, but are fundamental to the future efficacy and also the legitimacy of the MPD. And we believe that by embedding the diversity, the equity and inclusion into the fabric of the treaty, we not only enhance its humanitarian focus, but also its capability to foster a secure, a just and nuclear weapons free world. So um, that's all from our end. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, that's from the DI group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, I will hand over to our Engaging the P5 Working Group. This working group was chaired by Vivian Zhang, a uh, research technician at the Outer Space Institute, and Elena Batani, project advisor on youth and disarmament to UN Lyric. And with that, I will hand over. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anahita, for the inter inter uh, introduction as well. Uh, thanks, Kree, for kicking us off today. Um, I'll start by presenting the context and the approach of our policy paper uh, before giving it to uh, Elena to present the recommendations. So to start with, um, already Anahita mentioned this in the beginning that uh, we've seen humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons, HINW, uh, gain traction in the disarmament community in the past decades, um, which happened through multi-level level stakeholder conferences and particularly civil society driven initiatives, which all led to the TPNW. But then at the same time, we see the further erosion of arms control regimes. And one of the impacts this has is, of course, it widens the trust deficit between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states in the NPT context, which then makes it difficult to further arms control and, and disarmament. So we think, about, we think about how should one engage the P5 to address HINW. And um, to tackle this issue, our analysis takes the national policy approach to look at how each of the P5 states deal with uh, humanitarian impacts indirectly. We also examined how P5 states engage with HI conferences and ideas in multilateral diplomacy. And through this, we hope that uh, we can help to merge HI components into existing conventions and create more attainable solutions for international security. So what did we do exactly? Um, firstly, by doing research in the national language um, of each P5 state, we examined domestic legislation and governance measures. And through this, we found that P5 states don't make direct references to HI because, and this is not surprising, uh, statements and policies focus on deterrence, but they do address HI relevant issues through emergency response with different initiatives. And um, these are, for example, in public health, uh, cross-border aid coordination in environmental damages and civilian protection in case of nuclear incidents. And we feel like this emergency response angle could provide an opportunity for P5 states to build further capacity with non-nuclear weapon states, with civil society and academic experts by understanding HI more holistically. And moving on, we also explore the each P5 states engagement with the HI agenda at conferences. So although not all of the P5 states have participated in HI conferences, we do see that there are some interests in understanding HI better. And because each P5 state have their preferred fora and their groups where they like to demonstrate leadership, there is an opportunity for members in these fora and groups to use components or ideas of HI as a way of engaging P5 states in diplomatic discussions. So what can be done about these fundings? I will now give it to Elena uh, to talk about our recommendations. Thank you very much, Vivian, for sharing about our methodology and approach. Um, in terms of recommendation, we developed some recommendations that can be applied by P5 states at the national level 
and some recommendations that can be applied by P5 as a group. At the national level, we recommended to each P5 state to build internal capacity in understanding HI by merging emergency responses and crisis management measures into a comprehensive HS strategy. This strategy can take into account wider economic, social, and environmental factors associated with nuclear risk. So what are the benefits in terms of national interest of that? First, it contributes to uh, reduce security risk because it increases on the other side national re resilience. Second, it gives an opportunity to create internal collaboration and dialogue between different institutions working on nuclear risk, so including government, uh, academia, and civil society. And third, it contributes to reduce diplomatic risk, since by helping to formulate a clear understanding of what HI means for each state, it creates a basis for multilateral dialogue. And starting from that basis, we recommend to P5 that multilaterally as a group, they discuss how to integrate the HI agenda and the notion that is fundamental for P5 of undiminished security for all. So uh, to do that, um, the P5 can um, undertake research collaboration to share best practices, information, and discuss their common understanding. How can they do that? They can, um, we suggest that they can create a technical forum within the P5 to address the related topics such as crisis coordination, emergency response, and victim assistance, where international organizations such as uh, CTBTO uh, can offer assistance. Um, we suggest, secondly, that they create a dedicated project within the P5 Young Professional Network. And we believe that this approach could bring pre-5 to adopt further risk-reducing measures, such as detargeting cities and critical infrastructure. And to conclude, while we focus in our researches on measures that could be adopted by the P5, to promote this kind of approach, stakeholders can continue to engage each state through different fora. They can engage China through the G77 group, France through the European Union, and the UK and the US through the NATO. In addition, of course, to the NPT and the UN Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with that, I will hand over to our next working group, which is Nuclear Education and Knowledge. Um, and this working group chair uh, working group was chaired by Maren Vialov, PhD researcher at the Foreign Policy Lab of the University of Innsbruck, and Chase Howard, program uh, coordinator for the project on nuclear issues at CSIS. Uh, thanks, Anahita, and hi, everyone. I'm very happy to join this discussion today and present the research and key findings um, on nuclear education knowledge of our working group. Um, our paper is strengthening the humanitarian impacts of gender and nuclear education and raising nuclear awareness uh, within the NPT focuses on, I'll try to speak louder, <laughs> well, it focuses on three main areas. Uh, firstly, on what nuclear education is. Uh, secondly, on what is missing from the current nuclear education framework. And then thirdly, how to fill the gaps and the, avoid the biases. Our key assessment is that there is not so much a lack of knowledge, but rather a lack of awareness for certain types of knowledge. Uh, because the knowledge exists, there is a wealth of detailed information on the technical, strategic and historical aspects of nuclear weapons, but also on humanitarian, social, cultural, economical and environmental aspects accessible through public information, academic research, and courses, as well as specialized training programs. There are also numerous experts, institutions, and think tanks who focus on nuclear issues, providing extensive resources for those who seek them. But not everyone with knowledge is accepted as an expert, and their knowledge as expertise, that alone has the opportunity and means to attend and provide their knowledge in forums such as the NPT meetings. And therefore, not every type of knowledge has been given enough attention. 
The facts on the humanitarian, social, cultural, and environmental consequences of nuclear weapons have not been front and center for the past decades, particularly in the NPT context, but also within existing initiatives of nuclear education. This is due mainly to three factors. The current nuclear education often fails to adequately address the ethical and moral dimensions of nuclear weapons, leading to a limited understanding of the profound humanitarian consequences and ethical dilemmas associated with their possession and potential use. Secondly, the curriculum of existing education endeavors tends to focus more on technical and strategic aspects neglecting the extensive long-term health effects, environmental damage, and societal, societal disruption caused by nuclear weapons. This results in an incomplete picture of the true costs of nuclear conflict and nuclear weapons. Thirdly, there is often a lack of diverse perspectives in nuclear education, with insufficient representation of different cultural, geographical, and social viewpoints. This leads to a fragmented understanding and hampers development of well-rounded, informed decision-making and advocacy. Put short, awareness is lacking, mainly because there is a public engagement deficit. Despite the availability of information, public engagement and awareness remain low. Nuclear issues often receive less media attention compared to more immediate and visible crises, uh, leading to a general lack of public discourse, there are also educational gaps. In many educational systems, nuclear education is not part of the curriculum. This means that unless individuals actively seek out the information, they may remain unaware of the critical issues surrounding nuclear weapons. It's also an issue of complexity and accessibility. The technical and strategic nature of nuclear issues can be daunting to the general public, making the subject less approachable. Efforts to simplify and communicate these complex topics in more relatable terms uh, are often insufficient. Additionally, the discourse is often not only dominated by technical and strategic aspects of nuclear weapons, but also by actors and states that consciously perpetuate this focus, sidelining any other expertise and knowledge as to not being challenged in their continued reliance on and rigid adherence to nuclear weapons as their security guarantees. Therefore, in our paper, we recommend NPT states parties to develop a comprehensive nuclear education compendium, incorporating lessons learned and activities from past decades, particularly focusing on addressing blind spots in existing endeavors and concerning uh, the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. We also recommend NPT states parties to highlight and expand successful nuclear education initiatives by member states, groups of states, and civil society, broadening the educational scope to include all aspects of nuclear weapons with a specific emphasis on their humanitarian impacts. We would also like to see NPT states parties organize and promote diverse and inclusive nuclear education focused side events during NPT meetings, fostering a collaborative working group among all member states to develop and implement holistic nuclear education strategies. It would also be helpful if uh, states parties on a national level would regularly include nuclear weapon topics and parliamentary discussions to help demystify nuclear deterrence and raise awareness about the humanitarian impacts. It would be helpful as well on the national level to revisit educational guidelines uh, to integrate nuclear education across various academic levels and provide adequate funding and support to research and civil society involved in nuclear education, acknowledging their often limited resources and significant role in public awareness and education. States parties should particularly invest in initiatives that engage the younger generation in nuclear education and knowledge, preparing them for future leadership and decision-making roles in global nuclear governance. And they always should incorporate first-hand accounts of nuclear weapons survivors and victims into educational activities, integrating ethical and moral considerations to provide a more comprehensive understanding of the impacts and consequences. Lastly, states parties should broaden the scope of their nuclear education initiatives in existence to encompass various disciplines and utilize diverse formats such as social media and other digital platforms to create a more dynamic and compelling outreach content to engage a wider audience uh, effectively. 
Overall, the NPT regime needs a more comprehensive and inclusive approach to nuclear knowledge and education, better reflecting the plethora of research, lived experiences, and expertise that is in existence and goes beyond traditional folk and what is accepted and appreciated as nuclear knowledge and education. It's a common effort, and the NPT is the forum where education landscape can be shaped on all things nuclear and should be diversified and deepened. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next working group is the Working Group on Nuclear Safety and Security. Um, this working group was chaired by Saida Saba Batul, a teaching and research assistant at the School of Politics and International Relations at Qaeda Azam University in Islamabad, Pakistan. And with that, I will hand over. Thank you so much. Thank you, and a good afternoon to everyone. I am Saida Sabahatou, and our working group have critically analyzed the evolution of post Fukushima nuclear safety culture and have come up with some interesting policy recommendations on how to further advance the nuclear safety and security culture while strengthening the broader, the broader humanitarian impacts agenda within the trade of energy. So, the policy paper underscores the need to examine and advance the nuclear safety standards of NPT states their roles within the IEA and provide policy recommendations to fortify nuclear governance. So to understand what is nuclear safety, nuclear safety entails maintaining appropriate operational conditions, preventing accidents and minimizing their repercussions to safeguard workers, the populace and the environment from ex excessive radiation hazards. Now what happened in Fukushima 2011 accident was that a max massive earthquake and tsunami triggered the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster and highlighted severe gaps in nuclear safety protocols. This incident resulted in significant radiation release and the displacement of over 300,000 residents. This also underscores the, the vulnerabilities of nuclear facilities to extreme natural events. So when we look at how, to, how the evolution of nuclear safety standards and culture look like, Following the Fukushima accident, concerns about the inherent vulnerability of nuclear facilities were raised, in response to which there has been a global reassessment of nuclear safety standards led by the IAEA's action plan on nuclear safety. Uh, this plan emphasizes rigorous safety ass assessments, peer reviews, capacity building, and international cooperation. So uh, following the uh, accident, a debate started on whether Fukushima accident was preventable or not. Gaps in nuclear safety protocols, such as a lack of cooperation between off-site centers, Tokyo Electric Power Company, and the uh, Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency came under discussion. So moreover, there were many uh, conventions and events that followed. One of them was Japan-US Cooperation for Global Crisis Management. So um, this was post-Fukushima. Japan and the U.S. demonstrated a co commendable example of international cooperation and crisis management. The U.S.'s prompt crisis response included the deployment of crisis management staff and technological improvements like European pressured reactors and advanced boiling water reactors and establishing communication systems to Japan. The collaboration serves as a model for other countries, emphasizing the need for robust bilateral agreements and shared technology advancements to enhance nuclear safety and preparedness globally. Now, when we are talking about the humanitarian impacts of nuclear accidents, unsafe trade programs and applications, nuclear accidents are like Fukushima have profound humanitarian impacts from immediate uh, radiation exposure to long-term health issues and socio-economic disruptions. So uh, the evacuation and relocation efforts led to increased increase mortality among the elderly, mental health issues, and economic challenges. Moreover, the environmental contamination and loss of public trust in governmental uh, government oversight further intensified these impacts. The International Commission on Radiological Protection advised on dose limits to prevent excessive radiation exposure. Following the Fukushima disaster, assessments by the uh, WHO revealed significant radiation doses for both residents and workers, underscoring the critical need for stringent safety measures and emergency preparedness. So uh, me and my working group have uh, worked on some policy recommendations to fill in the gaps uh, in the nuclear safety department. There is a need for enhanced safety and security standards and a more regulated legal frameworks and policy revisions to strengthen operational conditions, emergency preparedness and response mechanisms to prevent, prevent and mitigate nuclear accidents and to update international legal frameworks to address emerging risks such as digital threats to nuclear facilities. 
Now, uh, the other the, the other recommendation is universal adherence to convention on physical protection of nuclear material is essential to ad advocate for universal ratification and implementation of these conventions to strengthen physical protection of nuclear materials and promote a culture of safety and security. There should be a diverse participation in nuclear safety di dialogues to promote nuclear safety culture, education, and training in nuclear science and technology to build a knowledgeable force and enhance public trust. It is crucial to bolster uh, monitoring and compliance mechanisms within NPT. This includes expanding the role of IEEE, fostering early career professional engagements, and enhancing gender diversity in nuclear security. By diversifying participation and encouraging inclusive approach, we can develop more comprehensive and effective safety measures. Then there is a need for more bilateral and multilateral cooperation to encourage countries to collaborate on crisis response, technological sharing, and policy development to enhance global nuclear safety uh, standards, just like the US and Japan partnerships. Then uh, lastly, NPT states should establish their own civil independent nuclear regulatory authorities in their respective jurisdictions to improve their nuclear safety standards. Now to conclude, advancing nuclear safety and security is essentially for peaceful use of nuclear energy, which is one of the core principles of the NPT. By learning from past incidents, enhancing international cooperations, and implementing robust policy measures, we can reduce the risk associated with nuclear technology. This, is, this not only strengthens the NPT or the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons agenda, but also contributes to a safer and more secure future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so due to some unforeseen circumstances, we're not able to have our working group chairs join us from the working group on the role of civil society. Um, this working group was chaired by Mackenzie Knight, who is a program associate for global risk at the Federation of American Scientists, and Callie Stan, who is a conference coordinator in the, at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, whilst they aren't able to join us, I did want to briefly offer an overview of their paper. Um, it's a really interesting one. So their paper titled Mediators, Champions of Transparency and Educators, Identifying the Roles of Civil Society in Strengthening the HINW Agenda Through the NPT, navigates the historically overlooked yet pivotal role of civil society organizations in advancing the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons agenda within the NPT treaty, um, and in particular within its review process. So the paper looks to examine the past successes of this process and the civil society portion of this community, and tries to underscore the tangible contributions of CSOs across three key roles. These three key roles are being mediator and information uh, providers, champions of transparency and accountability, and finally, as educators and awareness raisers. So accepting that CSOs have made impactful contributions to both the NPT process and the humanitarian discourse on nuclear weapons, uh, this paper argues that there is a compelling need to be able to unify these two spheres of success. Through its policy recommendations, their paper calls for greater collaborative efforts within the NPT process and outside of it in order to be able to amplify and harness the roles of CSO in CSOs in furthering the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons agenda process in general. Um, I really encourage you, of course, to read every single one of those papers. Um, but now, thank you so much to all of our speakers and for their wonderful presentations. We have time for some questions and answers. Um, so we have some in the chat, which I might go ahead and um, introduce first, but just as a reminder to our audience, thank you so much um, for those that you have contributed already. If you have any thoughts, comments or questions, feel free to use the Q&A function now. Um, so our first question for the Nuclear Knowledge Working Group, Maren, is what is the scope of the impacts of nuclear weapons use? Does that include education on a nuclear winter? Why and why not? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, short answer, yes. Uh, longer answer would be for a comprehensive and inclusive approach to nuclear knowledge and every education. Uh, all aspects of nuclear weapons need to be in there. So everything from mining to milling to testing, production, maintenance, and the impact of use should be reflected in, in the education scope. And this includes, of course, uh, the research and facts on the possibilities of nuclear winter. So it should be the full spectrum approach and not just uh, deterrence in there. Amazing, thank you so much. 
Um, we have a question for three. Um, Max Schout says, thanks to all the presenters for explaining their findings. This is very interesting. Um, and his question is, why are there different quotas for different delegation types? And regard regarding the scientific advisory group, would it be composed of IAEA employees or would it be independent from the IAEA and serve alongside it? Thank you very much for uh, bringing up this question. I think it's really um, like a great point and really gets to the heart of what we are trying to achieve with the NPD. So here's the deal with the different quotas from like various types of delegations. I think it's all about making sure that everyone gets what they need to also participate fully and fairly. And I think like, think about like this way, um, like big nuclear powers, they have a lot of resources and expertise, right? And they are often well prepared for these discussions, but they might like diversity in their teams. So that's where targeted quotas can help mix things up and bringing more women, uh, younger professionals and folks from different cultural backgrounds that I think like into the room, the shake into the conversation and also offer new perspectives. So I think these, um, you know, people often struggle just to get to the table, let, let alone like have a say when um, they are there. So for them, we are talking about support quotas, maybe like financial, maybe also about logistical that also help ensure they can show up, um, stay engaged and really make, um, you know, their voices heard. I think it's all about like, leveling the playing field so that when decisions are made so they can reflect a truly global consensus not just the view of the usual heavy hitters and i think what matters most is about when everyone from the big guns to the underdogs feels like they have a stake and can like influence the process so the whole system works better decisions are richer uh more robust and more likely to stick because they have been stress tested from all the angles so that's the goal and we want to treat that's not just the science one but also respected and then also like up upheld by all i think that's on my end thank you amazing and we've got another question from molly mcginty um i also have a question on the creation of an npt specific scientific advisory group recommendation which i think is an excellent idea are there any discussions happening with the tpnw scientific advisory group if instituted, how can we make sure that these two groups collaborate and don't further the silo between the NPT and TPNW? Thanks to all the speakers and organizers. Well, I think regarding the scientific advisory group, uh, like the proposed scientific advisory group, I would also answer the IAEI one. I think it would be an independent of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, adding to that, like to maintain also the neutrality and avoid potential conflicts of interest. Because I believe that while IAEA also plays like a critical role in nuclear non-proliferation safety standards, but I think that the scientific advisory group under the NPD would have like a broader mandate and focusing on like integrating diverse scientific insights from like various disciplines directly into the NPD policy. So I think if we have this structure, so it can allow us to also like have this holistic and interdisciplinary approach to like non-nuclear proliferation that also complements um, the technical and regulatory expertise of the uh, that body uh, for such like IAEA. Uh, and I think by ensuring the independence, the adverse advisory group would be uh, provided unbiased and scientifically rigorous ad, uh, advice to the NPD community and, and thus enriching, uh, you know, the treaty decision making processes with a wide range of scientific perspectives. I think, um, I hope it answers like the two questions all at the same time. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we have an anonymous question for the P engaging the P5 working group. How do you plan to take this work forward at the P5 level? Is there any scope for discussing these policy recommendations at the governmental level? Um, and if I may be so bold, I might actually tack on just a little follow-up question that I'm quite interested um, about why, what do you think it'll take to really encourage and maybe to demonstrate to P5 states why this should be a strict, like, kind of a priority area for them in the upcoming PrepComs and the v review process? Um, and I'll hand over to either um, working group chair who might like to come in here. Sure. I also want to ask if my co-chair Elena like to 
tackle the question first or I can go ahead as well. You can go first and then I cannot. Okay, sounds good. So for bringing up these um, aspects of humanitarian impacts to P5 states, of course, so in our recommendations, we look at how this can be done nationally and multilaterally. And multilaterally, of course, then it comes to, you know, individual fora uh, that we covered in the policy paper that um, certain P5 states have a more leniency to because of their um, national policy from, from this angle. Uh, and then we can have civil society as well as other states, so non-nuclear weapon states or other members of these foras to also be involved in um, in having discussions about HINW in these different contexts. And then nationally, of course, uh, which is why we took the more um, domestic law or domestic policy approach is because we also realized that sometimes external forces or discussions at multilateral fora doesn't really don't really translate to the national context. And that's why I think hitting this angle is quite important when it comes to demonstrating to P5 states why this is very important, not only in the MPT cycles, but also just to domestic policy that um, nuclear accidents, whether it's through, you know, the nuclear safety um, angle or from, you know, nuclear security in a more like nuclear weapons uh, side of things um, are not very holistically assessed and not holistically understood. And that's mostly because of our, our strategic approaches to nuclear weapons. And then also, you know, with to an extent also just with nuclear resources generally. So which is why in our uh, in our policy paper, we we continuously talk about the emergency response approach because this angle we think um, is not only understood by all the P five states because of course they have a higher risk of of those things happening because of their you know ownership and possession of nuclear weapons as well as nuclear resources, but um, also that uh, from a governance approach this is quite important you know just to make ensure the safety and security of their own territory of, of their own populations. So, uh, which is why we believe that uh, civil society here can play a very major role in, again, um, not only providing expertise, uh, but also uh, to bring up the conversation if they can, and also to have a role in uh, be consulted uh, for, by different governments um, or processes to further this agenda. Uh, that will be my input. Uh, Elena, if you have anything to add, please jump in. Yeah, maybe. Thank you very much, Vivian. Maybe just to add, when you're speaking about the P5, you're speaking about states that are uh, very different between them in terms of institutions, in terms of political and geostrategical objectives. So um, it's difficult to answer the question with a single answer that would work for every P5, even if we really try to stress that emergency, like tackle emergency response has a benefit for each one of them, especially in a context where nuclear tensions are rising and we are not protected by, from nuclear accidents. But um, if you are more interested maybe in one specific state, we really invite you to go through our paper where we try to, beyond this general recommendation that we shared, we really try to um, make some specific recommendation for um, each state uh, in the P5 group. And yeah, and I hope that uh, by reading the paper, you might find more precise answer. Thank you so much. Um, I actually have a question of my own for Saba on nuclear safety and security. I was curious with the ongoing war in Ukraine, whether you think that some of the concerns around, for example, uh, a disaster or nuclear accidents with the ongoing fighting um, with the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant in Ukraine, do you think that with the ongoing like review process, the upcoming PrepComs, that might contribute in any way to being able to build momentum on safety and security from a specifically humanitarian perspective? Of course, I believe that because uh, recently I was uh, also reading about this uh, debate going on about nuclear deterrence, has it prevailed or not. 
so that's interesting. And uh, it also falls under the nuclear safety and security domain that uh, wars uh, are having humanitarian impacts on people. And uh, should there be some additional protocols or some sort of, uh, you know, uh, treaties that people can sign so that, uh, you know, uh, states can sign before going for wars. So uh, that should be, they should go for limited wars and should not, you know, uh, endanger such nuclear power plants or such areas that have nuclear power plants and that war should be, you know, uh, uh, limited in that context. So I do believe that uh, PREPCOM is helping in that way because these are all the all of the policy recommendations are in favor of you know um, strengthening the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. So yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I will just wait a moment in case we have any further questions, but we are also coming to the end of our time, so it might be okay to stop there as well. If not, in that case, thank you so much for joining us today for the launch event of the EBN Anthology on strengthening the humanitarian impacts agenda within the NPT. Thank you very much to our working group chairs for their hard work, uh, expertise, and their absolutely brilliant leadership throughout this policy cycle, and for joining us today to be able to present their work and their findings. And of course, a huge thank you to every single one of our early career young um, professional EVN members who participated in this process and contributed to the papers. Um, we're really proud of this anthology, and I think that it makes for some really interesting dialogue um, with the upcoming PrepCom So Close, the ongoing review cycle, and also just in the wider context of the nuclear field at the moment. Um, thank you to the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their very generous support in funding this project. And as a reminder to everyone, this event will be record is recorded, and so it will later be available on the BASIC website and YouTube. And you can also find the anthology publication itself on the BASIC website too. Thank you so much to all of you who have joined. Um, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>